أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله الذي لا يبلغ مدحته القائلون ولا يحصي نعماءه العدون ولا يؤدي حقه المجتحدون الذي لا يضركه بعد الحمم ولا يناله غوص الفطن ثم الصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين حبيب قلوبنا وطبيب نفوسنا والشفيع ذنوبنا سيدنا ومولانا أبي القاسم محمد وعلى بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المظلومين لا سيما بقية الله في الأرضين صاحب العصر والزمان خليفة الرحمن ما ملنس والجان ولعن الله وعداه مجمعين إلى يوم الدين أما بعد فقد قال الله وقوله الحق بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم هو الذي أرسل رسوله بالحدى ودين الحق ليظهره على دين كله وكفى بالله شهيدا صدق الله العلي العظيم The privilege of faith has been our ongoing topic. Tonight is lecture number seven. We have now reached the uh, first week part of the month of Ramadan, and time now will begin to go very quickly in the month of Ramadan. Before you know it, uh, I'll be gone, and then the nights of Qadr will come, and the month that is a glorious opportunity will once again leave us. So it's good for us to kind of recap, revisit our goals, what we want to accomplish on a personal basis in the month of Ramadan. Uh, these days will fly by very quickly. You'll get yourself into a very good rhythm and a very good um, um, uh, motion in, this, in, in these days. So uh, do, do take a moment to kind of reflect on the past week to see how much closer have I gotten to Allah and how now we should start to begin that process I talked about on the very first night where now the body has adjusted to the fast, and now the eyes, the ears, the heart, the tongue is now all waiting to also enjoy the fast as well. Sallu ala Muhammad wa Muhammad. The basis of our discussion has been revolving around a revisitation of our faith, to strengthen our faith in the wake of the fact that there is a lot of money right now, a lot of time and energy being spent to dismantle or to confuse today's youth when it comes to our own personal ideology. And I, I, I find it a need to constantly repeat myself, I'm not sure why, maybe I'm wrong in this, to ensure that there is no confusion in these discussions. Uh, these discussions are not meant to break unity, they're not made to upset a certain group. You know, that only happens when you resort to um, lies or you resort to insults or you resort to cursing and that is of course outside the realm of our deen. These discussions are based on the Quran, on logic, on the ahadith, trying to strengthen our own backyard so we can do efforts towards the deen itself. Today, the problem that I see of course is the weakening sometimes of the yaqeen of our faith, the questioning of our ideology as I mentioned before. And last night we really began to kind of begin this topic within a topic we looked at those basic pillars and principles of our faith. And we talked about Ghadir last night in the very shortened discussion of half an hour, looking at the basic proofs, both the aqli proofs and the naqli proofs, those proofs that are intellectual in nature and that are narrative in nature, to discuss this very important day that really defined our ideology. And moving forward, you know, We've had a few of our Sunni brothers here during the week. Uh, they've come and sat in my lectures. I've talked to them during iftar. I know there might be a few here tonight as well. And we welcome that and we encourage that. And this discussion is a good, healthy discussion about the reality of faith and ideology inside the deen. We mentioned last night, true Islam is that Islam that goes through Ghadir and all the way down the line of Imamat. Which brings me to my discussion tonight and one of the biggest pillars of our deen and our ideology that really is a, um, a point of difference between us and our Ahl-Sunnah brothers 
is a discussion on divine leadership after the holy prophets. It's a discussion where, as I said, we disagree with our Sunni brothers, and they also disagree with us as well. The disagreement is not the existence of that leadership after the holy prophet. They also agree that a leader must be there. We also agree that a leader must be there. But the conditions and the qualities of that leader after the Holy Prophet is where we, of course, disagree. And this agreement is not a big deal. It's a, it's, a, it's a moment for a healthy discussion, which inshallah we'll have tonight. What I want to make sure that we establish tonight together is that not only the need of leadership, but that leadership has to be divine in nature. I mean, it must come down from the Creator for obvious reasons that we'll present. I will shy away from certain verses of the Qur'an only because if we present verses and ahadith in this discussion, then it can easily be wiped away as, it's, as it being up for interpretation. Meaning the Shias have their tafsir, we have our tafsir, and uh, you know, they could say that in terms of the argument. So let's kind of stick to intellectual and logical reasoning and then move from there. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. The first idea of, and, and I'll kind of piggyback on last night's discussion, of there not being a need for leadership is absurd. It's illogical. Every prophet before the holy prophet, every imam after the holy prophet, all felt the need, naturally, to announce a successor. The biggest difference is to look at the leadership after the holy prophet. We see it as not only a leadership of political in nature, we see it as leadership at the spiritual level. Keep in mind what the purpose of the creation of us by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was. And that is to reach ultimate kamal, ultimate perfection. In all aspects of our life, both our physical world in this, in this dunya and of course our spiritual metaphysical world in the hereafter as well. And the spiritual perfection has to be attained all throughout our life, be it with the Holy Prophet or be it post-Holy Prophet. Whereas our Sunni brothers believe that leadership is strictly on the political basis, where it is the expansion of the Islamic Ummah by conquering various lands. You look at the era of the first and second Khalifa, Khulafa, they were obsessed with conquering lands like Yemen or conquering lands like Syria or Shamat or other areas that later on were gifted to certain governors later on in their life. Or they were concerned about you know, strengthening the, the Islamic economy. And while that is a big portion of the Islamic government, no doubt, another portion that we focus on as the ideology of Shiism is the spiritual well-being of each believer, is the elevation of their internal nafs towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, is the purification of their soul, is the quieting of their nafs, is the strengthening of their resolve, all within the internal uh, uh, faith of the believer. So these two big distinct differences now will relate into them choosing their leader and us, of course, accepting our leader because of the various job descriptions, for lack of a better term, that exist between both governments. The reality is that the human being, the insan, is constantly in need of guidance. It's not the case where the prophet says, look, I spent 23 years, I perfected your religion, I gave you the book, I gave you my sunnah, and now that's enough for you to now be successful in this world. You don't need a spiritual guide after me, you have everything in front of you, all you have to do is tap into those resources. That's not the case. We've seen individuals, and I presented verses across the past seven nights that talk about the fact that we are easily now off the path. And sometimes we've seen people deviate on a path that they have been guided on already. Right? Ba'da idha hadaytana, as I said in Surah Al-Irman, verse number eight. And up and down, the Quran talks about those individuals where they either end up being the prey of shaitan or they end up turning their back against Allah, or they end up forgetting Allah to the point where Allah makes them forget about themselves. The point initially in tonight's discussion is that because the human being is constantly in need of guidance, we are in constant need of a guide. It's very simple logic. And now, who is that guide? What are the criteria and the qualities of that guide? That is up for discussion. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. 
and I just want to present half of a verse that talks about this idea that every nation will always need a guide. The Quran says, إِنَّ مَا أَنْتُ الْمُنْذِرْ وَلِكُلِّ قَوْمٍ had." For every qawm, there has to be a had, meaning a hadi, a guide. It cannot be the case where every nation uh, can present themselves in front of Allah and some can complain to Allah that you never sent a guide to us, towards us or some will thank Allah for sending a guide to us. That goes against the very adalat of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's important that because his main purpose, Allah, of creation is to bring us towards spiritual perfection, there has to be a guide to guide us towards that perfection. Now the first point that we have to discuss is the idea of isma and infallibility. Okay? We believe in the fact that any spiritual guide, either in the form of the prophets or the form of the imams, has to be ma'soom, for obvious reasons. If the purpose of that guide is to not only spread the Islamic ummah across the geographical lands, but also to elevate the human being at the soul level and reach that spiritual perfection, that imam, that guide himself has to be spiritually perfect. Otherwise, it becomes chaos. It becomes illogical. It's like me asking somebody, can you please, I'm not from here, I don't live in this area, can you please help me get to this person's house? I'll follow you in my own car, just guide me to where it's going. He'll say, sure, no problem. And halfway down the road, he calls me and says, I have no idea where I'm going myself. So now we are roaming around this area looking for something. He's lost, I'm lost, the blind leads the blind. And that could be fine if somebody, you know, shows you somebody's house, let's say down the road, but this is now Allah's command. This is God's purpose of creation. It can't be that he places that in the hands of somebody who might or might not help the, 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 the nation reach that level of perfection. So it has to be for the various reasons why the prophet has to be perfect. The imam or the leader after the prophet also has to be perfect. Remember, we keep in mind that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has a certain purpose in mind. We talked about something called qayd lutf a few nights ago. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. As difficult as it is to listen to a speech before iftar, it's equally that difficult to deliver a speech before iftar. So I know that, I don't know if today was a tough day for some of you, but hang in there please, inshallah. It's just a matter until 8.15. People often ask me why I don't wear my glasses on the minbar. They ask me that, really do. They ask me why I don't wear, because right now I can't see anything. And there's a reason why I don't wear my glasses on the minbar. Because if I see one person doing this in the audience, then it really throws me off. So I'd like to think that everyone is glued to me. Legit, I cannot see anyone's eyes right now, alhamdulillah. And for that reason, I'm assuming everybody is glued onto me. But sometimes, I'm not that blind, I could tell. <laughs> that this crowd is not with me tonight right now. Not only are you spare Sarah, but please. I have the utmost respect for you. I know it's very hard to sit there in the speech. Just please, 15 more minutes. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad, please. This is a very crucial discussion, and it is a revisitation for many of you. It's a reaffirmation for many of you. But believe me, when you, when you become approached or you approach you're approached by somebody who is challenging your belief and you, you not have the answers does not look good on you or the belief that you believe in either. Wow. It's important that we, again, find that certainty I talked about a couple of nights ago. So first thing is that ismat has to, have, has to be there. It cannot be that the imam or the prophet that's leading us towards perfection himself is in need of guidance. It's illogical, it's naqsul gharaz as they call it. It goes against the purpose of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It can't be that Allah says, look, I want you to reach Kamal, but I'm placing you behind a leader that he himself is lost, right? In no area does it make sense in our aql or our understanding, point number one. Point number two, the reason why we elevate the status of the imam and, and uh, above certain prophets even, and yes, that's our claim and we stand by it. And there's a reason for that. A lot of my youth ask us, why do we say imamat is higher than prophethood and nabuwat? First of all, let's, uh, let's examine that there are certain prophets that were also imams. 
The point is that our imams, be it our 12 imams, or by extension, you know, they call Nabi Ibrahim an imam inside the Quran, and the Prophet, of course, is also an imam inside the Quran as well. But we cannot say that certain prophets have a lower or a higher status than that of Amir al-Mu'mineen. Sheerly and only because the sheer responsible and responsibility of the imams is tougher and heavier than that of any prophet before them, except for the holy prophet. Think about it for a moment. You think about, for example, the successor of Nabi Nur or Nabi Ibrahim. You compare their job or their responsibility to that of Amir al-Mu'mineen, who's now taking this khazana, this treasure of a deen that is perfect and kamil and carrying that deen forward. Amir al-Mu'mineen wasn't only meant to protect that sharia, he was meant to propagate it, to defend it, to expand it. When the Jews would come, the Christians would come and question the Khalifa of their time that look, you know, you have this in your Sharia, how do you defend that? They would resort to Imam Ali. Or if there were new Masail and new issues that would come about that didn't exist in the Holy Prophet's time, it was up to the Imams now to make sure they extract using the proper resources, Hadith, Quran, Aqal, to be able to come to some sort of ruling. That's a huge responsibility. And for that reason alone, the status of the Imam is higher than that of the Prophet, no doubt. Because the responsibility is higher. So point number two, besides Ismat, is the idea that you must have what's called ilm al You must have that complete knowledge of the heavens and the earth. And to give you some idea what ilm al means. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad, please. If I had time, I'd explain what Ludun means in Arabic, but I don't have time. It's enough to know that Ilm al is not your normal type of Ilm. If I was to approach one of you, let's say, and say to you that, you know, let's say, for example, Brother Misam over there. Misam, for example, if I was to sit there and spend half an hour in trying to convince Misam that Misam, right now, you don't exist. And he'll say, okay, he'll say, I do exist. I said, no, 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 you don't exist. And I do my level best, I throw every possible philosophical reasons, big terms, four syllables, everything at him to convince him that Misam right now, you don't exist. And he can sit there and listen to me out of respect and say, look, Asubhai, with all due respect, you can throw all those fancy words at me, but my biggest dalil of my own existence is my own existence. I'm standing in front of you. No matter what you say to me, you cannot convince me that I don't exist. The ilm I have of my own existence is so strong that you can't convince me otherwise. That type of ilm is called ilm ladunni. Now, it's a simple example of Misam and his existence. We talk about the imams. Our claim is that that level of ilm that Misam has for his own existence is the same level of ilm that the imams have for the heavens and the earth as well. Ilm al at every possible moment. When the second Khalifa comes to Imam Ali, he says, how is it possible that whenever anyone has a question for you, you answer him right away? Any question whatsoever. And the Imam, fingers, asked the second Khalifa, how many fingers do you have? In one hand, he says five. That's what's called Ilm al that level of knowledge. That has to happen in leadership after the Holy Prophet. It cannot be that the Khalifa or the, or, or, or the Imam of Islam after a Holy Prophet is approached by a Jew, a Christian, a fellow Muslim, and they're asking him a shari'i masala, a shari'i question. He says, you know what? I don't know what the answer is. You're the highest official right now in the Islamic government. If you don't have that knowledge, who would have that knowledge? You are, you are representing not only the Prophet's chair, but his knowledge as well. So ilm al is critical. And thus we had many, many individuals, you should know and you do know, that Rome, Iran, these superpowers would wait for the Holy Prophet to pass away. And they would think when the Prophet dies, the deen will die as well. And so they would wait. That's why Ghadir is the day of the hopelessness of the kuffar as well. Because they never thought for a moment that, wait a second, if he gives this entire empire to Ali ibn Abu Talib, we're in big trouble after the Prophet passes away. 
And that's why Ghadir was the crushing of the enemies of Islam. Because he realized that if the Ummah took this Ali as his Khalifa, then no matter what we throw at him, physically, intellectually, emotionally, spiritually, he has an answer for everything. That's how the Khalifa and the Imam after the Prophet has to be. So Ilm al is huge. The third point I want to make, Sallu ala Muhammad wa Muhammad please. The more salawats you send, the more alive and awake you'll be, inshallah. Thank you very much. <laughs> the third point, and a very crucial point, is that the leader after the Holy Prophet has to be a hujjat of Allah on this earth. We refer to the imams as hujjatullahi ala ardi. On this earth, they are our hujjat. Or fil ardi, in this earth they are our hujjat, mean Allah's hujjat. What does that mean, Allah's proof? Look, it's very simple. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that I want you to be perfect. I want you to be spiritually sound. I want you to reach that level of akhlaq to the point where you fight your nafs. And if he doesn't send a model for us to follow, we can easily complain to Allah. That Allah, you wanted this for me, but you never sent me a guide. You never sent me directions. You never sent me a role model to follow. He'll say, yes, I did. In fact, I sent one that was from you, inside of you. Rasulam minhum, from you. Not from other planets or from the heavens or some other creation. No, he was a human like you, a bashar like you. He lived amongst you. He also had the same messiah that you did as well. The difference was that he was my proof to you. Meaning what? If you ever complain to me that I lived in Mecca, in a Jahil era, in a chaotic era, and you wanted me to reach you and reach you and reach you, and I couldn't because of my surroundings, he'll say, look, my Nabi, my Habib, my last prophet also lived in Mecca just like you did. If he could have reached that level, then you could also have reached a certain level as well. He becomes what? My hujjat on this earth my proof on this earth. And that proof has to continue after the Holy Prophet. It cannot be the case that the moment that Ghadir happens or the moment the Prophet passes away, all this system of Hidayat is thrown out the window. It can't be, it's impossible. Because again, Allah has a certain goal in mind. If he doesn't place the pr proper resources, that goal won't be met, okay? That's why when you look at a beautiful khutbah in Nahjul Balagha, by Imam Ali, alayhi salatu wa salam. Khutbah number two in Nahjul Balagha, beautiful khutbah. Near the end of it, he describes who Ali Muhammad are. He describes how the Prophet's family was used by who? By Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself. And that's when you really begin to understand the level and the maqam and the beauty of this family. And when you start to understand that, my youth, you start to understand a little bit of pride in what you believe in. When that pride kicks in, the privilege then kicks in afterwards. In khutbah number two, he says that Ali Muhammad, I mean the family of the Holy Prophet, are those who are the secrets of Allah's affairs, the valleys of Allah's knowledge, the mountains of Allah's book. And then he says beautifully, Beautifully, he says, through Ali Muhammad, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala straightened the bend in the back of the deen and strengthened the limbs inside the deen. The image is beautiful, meaning what he's saying, that the deen had bent for reasons that you and I know. It had bent and it looked weak in front of the enemy. To strengthen that deen again and strengthen the limbs Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala used the Prophet of Allah and the Ahlul Bayt alayhim salam to once again strengthen and, and, and straighten the bend in the back of the deen. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. And then he says, Hum asasu deen wa imadul yaqeen. They are the pillars of religion, the foundation of yaqeen. Who? Ali Muhammad. Because they're used afterwards to ensure that all of this zahmat, all of this effort by the Holy Prophet of 23 years is not given to some random individuals. It's given to a perfect family who is masoom in nature and they themselves are also fighting that internal nafs and reaching that spiritual kamal and taking the ummah with them. That's why time and time again, there was always a moment that after Saqifah happened, 
we of, often believe for a moment that Imam Ali and Sayyidah Fatima were quiet. They weren't quiet. She would go almost door to door, person to person, saying, were you not in Ghadir, were you not in Ghadir, were you not in Ghadir? And they would say, yes, we were. But we never for a moment believed that that was our spiritual successor. We thought that it was an announcement that was quite random. Then Saqifah happened, and we thought, okay, well, this exactly looks like the leadership. One point I want to make from yesterday, very crucial, to my youth especially. A point that I've made here before, but because we're talking about Qadir, it's extremely important. We should really thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that we were not there on the day of Qadir. And I say this with, you know, with a lot of respect, and I ask you to please, so far you've been very good with me, please continue to be good with me. Think about it for a moment, just on the image alone. On one side you have this 33-year-old man, okay, who would feed himself on dry bread and a little bit of water and some milk. His clothing was patched up. He had broken rope around his uh, shoes to keep his shoes on his feet. On the other side, you have this other individual who is older, maybe a white beard, maybe a little bit of a sujood on his forehead, maybe an abba, maybe a cane. And back then, the older you were, the more wise you were. I mean, they would equate wisdom to age. And now you have these, the, the, a picture of these two individuals, and you have the empire of Islam in front of you. You have this Islam that's growing in front of you. And you're asked now to choose between the two. Just on the vahir. These were people who were ignorant 23 years ago. It's not like, you know, I mean, they had elevated, but not to the point now where they're able to, you know, haq and, and batil. It's very difficult at that moment. That's why you have to blindly follow the Holy Prophet. Oftentimes, my teacher would say, it's not the fahada aliyun mola that's a problem. It's a man kunto mola that's a problem. They didn't quite understand the wilayat of the Prophet. To that, to, 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 on them to that extent, uh, let alone Imam Ali's reliance. So now to choose this individual who may not fit the bill on, on paper, as opposed to this individual who looks like a wise older man that should look like the face of Islam is a very difficult decision. That's why majority went towards Saqifa. And a handful, a handful stuck beside Imam Ali all throughout Ghadir and beyond. So we have the luxury and the privilege, again, I'll use, of being told by our mothers and our fathers and the ulama that this is what happened on Ghadir, this is why this is the right, the right path, stick to the path. But if we were there on that day, it's extremely difficult for us to make the right choice. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. So we have to truly understand that divine leadership is just that. It comes from divinity. It comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It cannot be left in the hands of the ummah. Yes, if you lower the idea of leadership to nothing but political governments, you know, balancing the treasury, let's say, for example, or leading the army towards battle, then maybe you can have people vote in the khalifa. You're talking about a spiritual journey that not only looks after the dunya of the followers, but the akhrat as well. That has to happen, has to be in the hands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because those qualities from ismat to ilm al to shuja'at to taqwa to all these things are an internal quality that can only be measured by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. How can you measure anyone's ismat or anyone's taqwa or anyone's ilm al on the apparent? You can't. You have to leave that up to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So yes, we absolutely believe that leadership after the Holy Prophet is a divine leadership that goes through Imam Ali, his sons, and all the way down to our 12th Imam. Even in the ghaybat of the 12th Imam, which is not the ideal situation right now, there's still leadership left behind, albeit not divine in nature. It's the second best option that we have. We accept the fact, no one here claims that our maraj are ma'asum. A lot of you will argue that, look, what about the ghaybat of the imam? Where's that divine leadership now? You should know and all of you know that while the imam is ghaib, he's also hadir as well. We're not waiting for the huzur of the imam. We're waiting for the zuhur of the imam. It's a big difference. The imam is hadir, but he's not dhahir. And if I had time, I'd explain. I don't have time. The fact that you've been this good this long is a miracle. So two more minutes. 
The idea is that even when the Imam is ghaib, he's still guiding the maraji of today. One very famous story of Tamas al-Dua, of Alama Majlisi. And you know this story very well. Just a reminder to all of you and myself. Alama Majlisi was a big scholar in the 7th or, or, or 6th century. In Baghdad, he was the marja of the time. One time, the story says that somebody had come from a local village, riding into Baghdad, entered the mosque. Where is Majlisi? I need Majlisi. Why? What happened? An issue happened in our village. We need to find out what to do. What's the issue? An eight-month pregnant woman has now passed away. The fetus is now eight months old inside of her stomach. Do we bury her with the fetus? Do we extract the fetus and allow her to be buried without the fetus? Alama says to bury her with the fetus. He takes that fatwa and goes towards the village. Okay, on the way before he enters the village, there's somebody behind him who stops him. He says, look, I'm coming to you from Alama Majisi. And to tell you that the fatwa is flipped. Extract the baby and bury the mother without, without the child. Okay, thank you very much. A few days later, he again sees Alama Majisi. Says, Alama, I got your message. I got the change. We took out the baby. Alhamdulillah, they're doing well. And we buried the mother uh, after she passed away. He realizes, Allah, Mama, you see, that wasn't me, nor did I send anybody, and knew it was the Imam of our time who went and tracked down this individual. He writes a letter to the Imam, says, Ya Sahib al Zaman, I am no longer worthy of ijtihad and being a marja. I denounce the right for me to give fatwas. The response comes from the Imam, Majlisi, your job is to give your fatwas according to your research. My job is to guide you in that fatwa as well. And that still exists today. We absolutely believe that our maraji have access to the imam and have meetings with the imam. So let's not be fooled to think that divine leadership has shut off after the imam has gone into ghaybat. No, it continues, but through a wasila now, not directly. We ask you Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to accept our qaleel ibadat insha'Allah. We ask you Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to help us understand our deen better and have that yaqeen and certainty, inshaAllah. We ask you Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to weaken the hands of the enemies of Islam. We ask you Allah to unite the ummah and to understand that there is more things that are alike in us than there are different. And finally, Allah, we ask you make us isqabil and worthy of the imam's arrival and to make us beside him before he comes, inshaAllah.